Good evening. Does it make sense to ban the bomb in Britain, or would that mean national suicide? The next election will be the first in our history in which a major party is committed to getting rid of all the nuclear weapons on which Britain's defence at present depends. If Labour is elected, and they certainly believe their new policy will win votes, they'll be abandoning a theory of nuclear deterrence which no government has questioned since the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima 37 years ago. These are, are some of the most powerful of the weapons in the world's nuclear arsenal. And as this forest of missiles grows, the debate is about our very survival. One side says that all the disarmament talks with the Russians have got us nowhere, that they have at best only regulated the nuclear arms race, not ended it, that only a brave gesture of unilateral nuclear disarmament will break the logjam before the accumulated weight of nuclear weaponry blows us all to pieces. The other side says that this is, at best, well-intentioned naivety, at worst, a selfish failure of nerve, that our safety can only be assured by the balance of terror that's existed since the 50s, that without nuclear weapons we increase, not reduce, the prospect of a war in which we would have no ultimate defence. Well, with us tonight and talking publicly for the first time is Admiral of the Fleet Lord Lewin, Chief of the Defence Staff during the Falklands campaign, who retired just a fortnight ago. He's joined by one of his predecessors in Britain's top military job, Field Marshal Lord Carver, and by Professor Robert Neal, the first director of the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. Joining us by satellite from the Pentagon will be America's Assistant Secretary of Defence, Richard Pearl. And on the political side of the studio, Mr John Silkin, Labour's Shadow Defence Minister, will argue Labour's new policy with Mr Peter Blaker, Minister for the Armed Forces in the present Conservative Government, and Dr David Owen, Defence and Foreign Affairs Spokesman, for the SDP. Now, all sides can see that if it were ever to happen, a nuclear attack on Britain would be utterly devastating. 200 Russian one megaton nuclear warheads might fall on Britain in a single day. The first notice of the attack would come from the early warning station at Filingdales in Yorkshire. Within two and a half minutes, a 7,000 power operated and 11,000 hand operated sirens began to sound. We should all be aware of attack warning red. Only minutes later, the first missiles would reach their targets. The BBC film A Guide to Armageddon describes what would happen if just one of those warheads exploded over St Paul's Cathedral. The initial heat is so great that the bronze cross would vaporise. The cathedral's contents would be consumed. Anyone in the open for seven miles around would be fatally burned. Then comes the blast. Bodies and buildings alike will be pulverised. Seconds after this single nuclear weapon explodes, 850,000 people will be dead. It was to deter any attack on the West that a Labour government took Britain into NATO. At NATO's military headquarters, an American is a supreme Allied commander. He's the embodiment of America's commitment to defend the territory of NATO's European partners as if it were her own. The Europeans value that guarantee, but at the same time they're frightened by the superpower's arms race. To meet that concern, NATO has been trying to reduce its reliance on nuclear weapons and improve its conventional strength. So, how credible a deterrent is the Alliance today? When it comes to intercontinental strategic missiles, America has more nuclear warheads than Russia, but the destructive power of the Russian warheads is much greater, so the strategic military balance is pretty equal. The problems arise when East and West meet in Europe. Where the Warsaw Pact is tightly grouped around its leader, Russia, NATO is widely spread, with its most powerful member, America, far away across the Atlantic. So striking a stable military balance in Europe is much more difficult. In manpower, NATO in Europe outnumbers the Warsaw Pact, 2.1 million men in uniform to 1.7 million. But of course, Russian reinforcements are much closer. In conventional armaments, the Russians have far more tanks than NATO. But this important advantage could well be cancelled out by NATO's superiority in anti-tank weapons. In terms of conventional war, says the International Institute for Strategic Studies, there would still appear to be insufficient overall strength on either side to guarantee victory. <laughs> 
the consequences for an attacker would be unpredictable and the risks, particularly of nuclear escalation, incalculable. We are not conventionally strong enough to take the Russians on and be sure of beating a conventional attack. And we have to recognize ourselves, and there's no point in uh, denying this, that if in a very early stage there was a complete drive through and a likelihood of a collapse, we might have to say, if you go on with this, we're going to start using nuclear weapons. But it's precisely in nuclear weapons based in Europe that NATO sees itself at a real disadvantage. Russia has twice as many long and medium range missile warheads that would probably get through as NATO does, 1,085 to 563. At the moment, NATO has nothing at all to match the 600 Russian intermediate missiles like the new SS-20. That's why NATO has decided to develop and deploy its own intermediate weapons. 108 Pershing II ballistic missiles are destined for Germany and 464 Tomahawk cruise missiles will be distributed like this. 48 each in Belgium and Holland, 96 in Germany, 112 in Italy, and 160, the largest number, in Britain. Unless agreement can be reached with the Russians at the Geneva disarmament talks, then deployment will begin in December 1983. At Greenham Common in Berkshire, a reserve NATO airfield is already being prepared to receive 96 cruise missiles. It's to strengthen the credibility of the nuclear deterrent that cruise is being stationed here. But it's cruise which has breathed new life into the campaign for unilateral nuclear disarmament. President Reagan cannot ignore us because President Reagan does not own Britain and Europe. This is our continent and we will shape it for ourselves. We have got to become more vociferous in our campaigning. We have to begin and embark upon a course of civil disobedience to bring it to their attention that we're not prepared to accept nuclear annihilation. Be careful, we're At Greenham Common, police have moved in more than once to evict a group of women who for months have camped outside the gates but they're still there in all weathers. The anti-nuclear campaign is growing more determined. It now includes not just romantic disarmers, but people convinced that nuclear deterrence is neither credible nor safe. These women are calling a rally here on December the 12th the anniversary of NATO's decision to deploy crews. It's a date that will be marked all over Europe. In France, anti-cruise demonstrations have begun to threaten the French independent nuclear force to frack. In Italy, there have already been big demonstrations against crews, and not just by the communists. And in West Germany, the Green Party has done well at the polls because of its determined opposition to crews the Greens could even hold the balance of power after the German elections next spring. The fear that unites these different movements is that with Cruz and Pershing, America is preparing to fight a nuclear war limited to Europe. As Helmut Schmidt, until last month, West Germany's Chancellor says, a war, even though regarded as tactical by the superpowers, is nonetheless a war of annihilation for the countries of the battlefield. Well, this is the battlefield. This is the wall that divides the two Germanys, the iron and concrete curtain between East and West. And this is the way the Russians would come if they ever did invade. The British Labour Party says that getting rid of nuclear weapons will make Britain safer because we would no longer be a target. We might hope to escape any war. That hope is denied the West Germans on the front line. If the battle for Europe ever begins, they are bound to be the casualties. And that gives what they think about nuclear weapons a special importance. The prime concern of the Germans is the prevention of war. Uh, and for that reason, we have not failed to notice that contrary to the rest of the world, for the last, well, for the last 20 or 30 years, you've had millions of deaths, hundreds of wars. There hasn't been one single shot fired in Europe between East and West. 
and it has a great deal to do with nuclear weapons and the uncertainty it creates for the aggressor. So even as a socialist, you can't welcome the Labour Party's decision? We deplore it and regret it. Uh, I think uh, most European countries, with the exception of certain groups, uh, will not welcome it. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a st it's a step backward as far as stability and security in Europe is concerned. Eugene Rostow, America's director of disarmament, has been touring NATO capitals to take the anti-nuclear temperature. Dr. Rostow is keenly aware that the failure of multilateral talks with the Russians to bring about real nuclear disarmament has led to the rise of unilateralism. I take these problems very seriously, but I'm much more concerned uh, about the rise of isolationism in America and of movements for, um, well, what the French would call sauve qui peur and devil take the hindmost, which are everywhere under the impetus of nuclear anxiety. That's what we're trying to overcome by restoring the credibility of the American guarantee, the nuclear guarantee, and improving alliance solidarity. How do you react to the Labour Party's decision to go for a non-nuclear policy? Well, that's for the Labour Party to decide and to decide also on what will happen. In the end, I'm very confident of the good sense of the British people. You mean it will never be put into effect? I didn't say that. What do you mean? I mean, I'm confident that the British people will, will uh, reach the necessary political conclusions, and I'm not worried about the future of our policy. I'm much more worried about the attitudes of the Soviet government than I am of the, about the attitudes of the British people. Five, four, three, two, one, now. It was a Labour government that made the first British nuclear bomb. Ever since, a section of the party has struggled to reverse that policy. This year, they succeeded. Do not fall again for the obscene paradox that we must first build a bomb in order to ban the bomb. And do not be afraid of unilateralism. Do not be afraid of the choice the British people will make if we give them a clear choice between the nuclear arms race under Thatcher or nuclear disarmament under Michael Foote. By a huge majority, conference decided that the next Labour election manifesto would contain an unequivocal, unambiguous commitment to unilateral nuclear disarmament. Labour will abandon Britain's own nuclear deterrent close down all nuclear bases in Britain and prevent the deployment of the cruise missile. Suppose we said to the Americans, take your cruise missile bases out of Britain and no way you're going to deploy them in Britain. What effect would that have on NATO? It would be a, a serious matter in terms of the cruise missile forward deployment capability. But again, more importantly than that, is the attitude of mind which is shoving off onto the Americans uh, to do the unpleasant jobs uh, and trying to keep our hands clean. Uh, militarily, it would be bad for us, uh, and to my mind, overall, that is in NATO, and to my ma mind, it would be a rotten thing for the British to do. Michael Foote's made it absolutely plain that a Labour government would do just that. It would not have cruise missiles in Britain. Well, if Michael Foote is elected to be Prime Minister with the government, uh, he is the elect of the people, and he will no doubt carry out his own policies. It won't make me agree with the matter as a NATO Commander-in-Chief, but... Uh, that is a matter from which I shall be standing aside. How damaging would it be to NATO? It would be damaging in the military sense and in the sense that it would show that the resolution of the NATO allies to stand together, nation by nation, would be weakened and it would have an effect on the smaller countries who would begin to say, well, Britain's beginning to ease off. What's the future of this alliance? Like NATO generals, the Conservative government is worried Last week, it unveiled its own deterrent to the anti-nuclear onslaught. This controversial Ministry of Defence film argues that NATO itself could not survive if a British government ordered its soldiers to do without nuclear weapons. How could we expect the protection of NATO? We'd have to leave the alliance, which then would collapse, since we're one of its political and military cornerstones. And where's the morality there? <laughs> 
History is full of examples of bigger powers riding roughshod over the neutrality of smaller nations with weak defences. A neutral Britain today would be a rich prize as a Soviet satellite. Is that what we want? Remembering how many millions of people since 1917 have died premature deaths under Russian rule? Professor, uh, Professor Neild, you heard what that um, Ministry of Defence film said there, that to abandon nuclear weapons unilaterally would be to make ourselves in Britain in the last resort defenceless. Now, isn't that a fundamental truth that you can't really escape? No, I think the crucial question is what you do about conventional defence. I do not regard nuclear deterrence, and particularly the possession by Britain of independent nuclear weapons, as being a rational defense policy. And NATO relies far too much on nuclear weapons, as plenty of people, including some of my military colleagues here, agree. And I think it would be absolutely sensible for Britain to get rid of nuclear weapons on one condition, which is that it would be entirely foolish, in my, to my mind, to leave NATO, which is an alliance of nations to go to one another's aid. And it would also be entirely foolish not to look to your conventional defenses and make sure that you possess, as an alliance and as a nation individually, a capacity to defend yourself against any potential Soviet conventional attack. But how could and you there are the possibilities of doing that. But how could you defend yourself against what might turn out to be a, a Soviet nuclear attack if you hadn't got nuclear weapons of your own? Nothing can defend you against a nuclear attack. Possessing your own weapons will not defend you against an attack. Possibly you mean a threat. Now, this notion that you might be threatened by nuclear weapons, blackmail as it's commonly called, is banded about a great deal. But it is exceedingly hard to find any example, a possibly one or two tenuous examples since the war, of a nuclear power threatening a non-nuclear power. I leave aside the jockeying between the United States and the Soviet Union. It That's just wouldn't happen, I think. Well, there are 150 nations in the world that live without nuclear weapons and do not yield to this fear by saying we must have them to avoid blackmail. I've lived in Sweden for five years. I've lived in Switzerland at one time. I would be perfectly happy to join the number of those nations which live without nuclear weapons kept for this rather far-fetched notion that without them you might uh, suffer nuclear blackmail. Sir Terence Lewin, I called you Lord Lewin a little while ago, but I gather the Queen hasn't actually stamped your cards yet. Um, Sir Terence, you were, until a fortnight ago, our, our top military man in Britain. What is your reaction to that? I think it's very important to be clear that um, NATO is a defensive alliance which has existed now for more than 35 years. The whole basis of the alliance is a deterrence po deterrent policy uh, which depends on the fear of the use of nuclear weapons. You're saying that because they've been there and because there hasn't been a war in Europe, they've worked? Yes, they have worked, and you showed the horrors of nuclear war. You didn't, of course, show the pleasures of peace, which we've enjoyed for 35 years, which NATO has secured, and the NATO policy of deterrence based on nuclear weapons has secured. But if that is so successful, it seems to me a bit difficult to find the evidence for it, wouldn't the logic of that mean that, for example, in the interests of peace, we should give nuclear weapons to Israel and the Arab countries? Certainly not. Um, we are discussing na the NATO against the Warsaw Pact and our own position. Now, I don't think anybody would disagree that NATO is the cornerstone of our security as far as the Sov Soviet and the Warsaw Pact is concerned, uh, and that the cohesion of the alliance is fundamental to us, and this means the United States' involvement in NATO. Now, if we were unilaterally to give up nuclear weapons, this, in my view, would put at risk the cohesion of NATO and so would undermine our security. I'd we like would to run the risk of losing the United States' support for the alliance. I'd like to come back to that again in a moment. Of course, that has a political dimension as well as a military one. But can I come to you, Lord Carver? Uh, unusually for such a senior soldier as yourself, perhaps, you've got some doubts about NATO's present nuclear defense policy. Do you find the nuclear deterrent, as we have it at the moment, credible? Do you think the Russians believe that we would press the button first, if need be? I, I think they probably don't. But what I do think they find credible uh, is that we would retaliate with nuclear weapons if they used them. And I think, uh, I mean, I feel strongly that NATO has 
has not grown up, has not accepted the fact, which is now at least 25 years old, that if you were to fire off a nuclear weapon, if you were the one to start a nuclear war, you must assume that the other side would answer back in kind. They have the capability to do it, and they have always, and very consistently, said they would do so. Um, I entirely agree uh, with Terry Lewin that what is absolutely essential to our security is the cohesion of the NATO alliance. My fear is that if NATO continues with an unrealistic uh, um, and really suicidal nuclear policy of threatening to use, to be the one to start a nuclear war, threatening to, threatening first use because it fears a conventional defeat, then NATO will be torn apart at the very time when it needs unity. If, if anybody really thought, if somebody really thought that a war was imminent in Europe, um, one cannot imagine for one moment that, that NATO would be unitedly firmly behind a, flick, uh, behind a policy which was liable to make them be the first to use nuclear weapons. So Terence, thinking about the purely military effects of any change in policy, what would happen to us and to NATO, do you think, if Britain under a Labour government refused to have anything more to do with nuclear weapons? Would it matter militarily at all? Well, of course it would matter militarily, but all things are possible. And if in a democracy a government decides to uh, carry out such a policy, then it is up to the military to make the best of it. You, you say it, all things are possible. Is a non-nuclear defence possible? Uh, we are members of NATO, and NATO has a nuclear defence, and NATO's nuclear defence would continue if NATO indeed continued after a British unilateral renunciation of nuclear weapons, which I doubt. Would a, a, a defence policy for NATO which did not rely upon nuclear weapons, as Professor Neil would like it to do. Would that be feasible in your view? No, it would not. Nuclear weapons cannot be disinvented, and the Russians have them. And if NATO had no nuclear weapons and the Russians had nuclear weapons, this would be in a quite impossible situation. Lord Carver, could I just clarify what you're, you're saying? You believe that we should commit ourselves to no first use of nuclear weapons. Now, as I see it, the logic of that again, rather like Professor Neil, is that you would accept a conventional defeat. Um, well, you might have to accept a conventional defeat, but the reality is uh, that if you decided, in the hopes of averting a conventional defeat, to be the first to use nuclear weapons, and the other side answered back, all you would have done would have been add a nuclear defeat to a conventional one. Well, now, suppose uh, you are being defeated conventionally, the other side does not use nuclear weapons, you are defeated, there's no point then, surely, in ever using nuclear weapons once you've been defeated. So what is the point of having them in the first place? The, po the, point, the sole point of having them now, in my opinion, is to prevent the other side from using them. Uh, uh, and that is all that the great, enormous arsenals of both sides now do, in my opinion. They are a very strong, very strong deterrent between the Soviet Union and the United States getting into any form of conflict with, with each other. But if, tragically, tragically, that deterrent were to fail, I believe the second function that they serve is that they would deter both sides from using them. And I think we should be very grateful for that very strong contribution that the possession of nuclear weapons by Soviet Union and the United States with a retaliatory cap capability the, 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 the contribution that makes to world peace. Professor Neil, General Rogers, NATO's supreme commander in Europe, is calling for more money from all of us so that he can increase NATO's conventional strength and move away from a reliance on the early use of nuclear weapons. That sounds like good sense. Is that a significant move in the direction of a non-nuclear policy, such as the Labour Party is determined to have, do you think? Two points. First, when NATO was formed, Europe was on its back, frightfully poor after the war, and reliance on nuclear weapons was necessary. We're now, Western Europe, really the richest of the three groups of either the Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact, we're bigger and richer than them, we're bigger and richer than North America and Canada. We have the economic capability to produce our own conventional defense. And we should do it. That is point one. The second question is, we should do it on two conditions. One, that we genuinely draw back unilaterally, without getting deadlocked in negotiation, 
nuclear weapons from the battlefield as we substitute better conventional forces. Second, we should be careful that the conventional forces we introduce are, so far as this is possible, of a defensive character and don't involve hundreds of tanks that are menacing to the Russians. So that we avoid generating a conventional arms race. The danger of General Rogers' position, which is wholly ambiguous at the moment, is that we may end up with more conventional forces as well as more nuclear forces, and we might end up with more conventional forces which were sufficiently offensive in nature to induce a reaction by the Soviets and get us into a conventional arms race. Do you I think both those things could be avoided, but you must be careful. Do you find any support for your views, uh, for this sort of unilateral pullback amongst military men? Uh, this varies in this country. Well, there's General Carver beside me who sees, as I do, the follies and, in a way, the hollowness of NATO's present first use strategy. There are many people in America, particularly the so-called Gang of Four, who've come out. If you go to Germany, Mr. Mr. you will you mean the former McNamara Defense Secretary. Yeah. and others there. If you go to America, you will find a certain number mm -hmm. of military people, retired ones, as a rule, who speak out this way. You'll so you find want them to in Germany. And, of course, in neutral countries like Switzerland and Sweden, which have considered acquiring bombs and drawn back from it, you find the establishment in those countries taking this view. Sir Terence, um, Sir Henry Beach, who was, I think, one of your top generals when you were serving, says that the actual use of nuclear weapons is morally indefensible and that using them would make a phrase like in defense of Western values absolutely meaningless. That seems to me rather what Lord Carver's saying. It seems to make the idea of using them very incredible indeed. Well, I think war is morally indefensible. And the whole aim of deterrence is to prevent war. And the, the basis of deterrence at the moment is nuclear weapons. Now, if we have to use nuclear weapons, then deterrence has failed. Now, the whole background to deterrence is uncertainty in the mind of the enemy. And this is why I feel that a first use policy uh, cannot be accepted. Because if you say there is no first use, you have removed one bit of doubt from the enemy's mind. But the point really is, isn't it, that uh, if, how can you at once say we uh, nuclear weapons are so horrible that we can't really imagine using them, and on the other hand, plan to use them as a deterrent? Uh, is the deterrent credible? Well, it's been credible for 35 years and has kept the peace. Well, and I expect it to continue to be credible into the future if we maintain our balance of nuclear and conventional forces. Well, let me stop there for the moment and bring in Richard Pearl, if I can, Assistant Secretary of Defense in Washington, the Pentagon. Mr. Pearl, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I can. If Mr. Silkin here becomes Defense Minister, let's say, in a, in a Labour government and puts into effect Labour's non-nuclear defense policy, what effect would that have on America and the part America plays in the defense of Europe? Well, I think it would represent a, uh, an historic turning away from an alliance that has been built on transatlantic solidarity, on a sharing of risks and burdens on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, it would cause, I would think, uh, dismay uh, within the alliance generally, not only in the United States. Would you want us to remain members of NATO if we wouldn't dirty our hands with nuclear weapons? I think it would be difficult to hold the alliance together if a member as important as the United Kingdom were to pursue a strategy inconsistent with the previously agreed upon strategy of the alliance as a whole. How about the special relationship? If we were to kick out your cruise missiles, do you think we could still be the close ally that uh, we like to think we are? Obviously, we hope it would not come to a situation in which uh, the United Kingdom went such a separate way that it was not possible to imagine a coordinated uh, uh, Western strategy. I don't think the mood here would be one of uh, retaliation. It would be one of... Uh, sorrow and concern for the security of the United Kingdom as well as the rest of the alliance. Dr. Rosto there was speaking about uh, 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 the fact that he was worried about isolationism in, in the States, that he was more worried about that than the tide of unilateralism here and in Europe. What's your point of view on that? I think any American administration would find itself in the position of having to explain to the American people that we ought to be prepared to take a risk in defense of the United Kingdom that the United Kingdom was ill-prepared to take in its own behalf. And to the degree to which there is always some isolationist sentiment in America, uh, 
that's a very difficult argument to have to make. I would hope we wouldn't find ourselves in that situation. Do you think you'd be bringing troops home from Europe? It would certainly make the burden of persuading the American people that they ought to take the risk of uh, uh, defending Europe a good deal more difficult to, uh, to sell at home. Can I put a rather different point to you? Uh, can I suggest to you that it's specifically Mr. Reagan's administration, which is really responsible for the upsurge in demand for unilateral disarmament in Britain and Europe. The charge is that while you're eagerly acquiring new and, and more dangerous nuclear weapon systems for yourselves and for NATO, you're not putting much real effort into the disarmament talks with the Russians. Well, let me say that we're putting a, a serious and sustained effort into the disarmament negotiations in Geneva. Uh, we have proposed, as you know, that uh, uh, forces of intermediate range, ballistic missiles on both sides, uh, should be dispensed with, the so-called uh, zero option. We worked hard to develop that. Uh, we've made quite far-reaching proposals in the strategic talks in Geneva as well. And I'm afraid I must take issue with the notion that we are engaged in uh, uh, a significant uh, build-up of nuclear weapons. The, the fact is that the United States has fewer nuclear weapons deployed today than we had in the 1960s. 8,000 fewer nuclear weapons than at the peak. Uh, we have 1,000 fewer today than uh, we had in Europe uh, as recently as two years ago. On the whole, the trend on the Western side has been reductions in the number and the capability of nuclear weapons, while on the Soviet side, the trend has been a steady and sustained increase. Well, can I just interrupt you and put you something Mr. Reagan's been saying? Uh, he said, for example, the other day, a nation that puts its faith in parchment and paper and gives up its protective hardware never lasts long enough to write many pages in history. And one, one more remark. There's no way to wish aside the realities in the world which demand that we rearm and do it expeditiously. Now, those remarks sound over here more like uh, rearming than disarming. You know, I, it seems to me that uh, the United Kingdom faced a situation in the 1930s in which it had the choice of rearmament uh, or the choice for which, in fact, it opted. And it didn't produce peace to, to delay the rearmament until it was too late. It, in fact, produced a catastrophic war. What the president is saying is that if we are to achieve balance and stability, if we are to negotiate uh, agreements that will enable us to cut back on the number of weapons, we have to be prepared to maintain forces that are adequate to deter. Mr. Pearl, I'm going to say thank you very much there. I'm most grateful to you for joining us. Can I come now to you, John Silkin? Is it Labour's new policy that you don't believe nuclear weapons deter anymore, or that you think somebody else should do the deterring for us? <laughs> well, we, let's say, start positively, believe firmly in NATO. It was a Labour government, as I think you said, that started NATO 33 years ago in 1949. And we believe that NATO is correct because collective security is better than individual security. No question about that. But that <coughs> means that every nation has got to contribute according to its own ability. Which weapon system it adopts is something that each nation requires to ascertain mainly for itself, but together with its allies, depending upon its economic strength and various other factors. Now, as far as nuclear weapons in Europe are concerned, the truth of the matter is this. You cannot limit the use of nuclear weapons inside Europe. Once one nuclear weapon, one small nuclear weapon goes off inside Europe, if it does, it's going to spread until you have a major nuclear war between the two parties. As Lord Carver says, there's a, at the moment, a balance between them. Both of them can destroy the world several times over, and that's, at the moment, what is keeping them But apart. But how, how about the now, question I asked you? Yes, I I'm, mean, I'm do you believe that, that uh, nuclear weapons are a deterrent, or are they not? I believe that the, the possession of nuclear weapons by the United States is a deterrent as far as Russia is concerned. The possession of nuclear weapons is a deterrent as far as the United States is concerned. The difficulty is if something starts either lower down inside Europe or anywhere else, or if an accidental nuclear war were to start, then those two would go off and there would be no deterrent. That's the terrible thing. What you're doing might be interpreted as making a gesture which you believe will be electorally popular while at the same time proposing to shelter under NATO's nuclear umbrella. Under NATO's umbrella, we all shelter. As but it's a nuclear umbrella. No, wait a minute. It's a nuclear and a non-nuclear umbrella.
I was very interested in what Mr. Pearl said, but the truth of the matter is that it is the Royal Navy that has preserved the United States' independence for a very long time indeed. They're as dependent upon us as we are dependent upon them, and so is every member of NATO. It always was But we, so. we won't be pulling our, f our weight, will we, if we want to remain in the Alliance without we handling will be some of the munitions if we that do, NATO if has. If we contribute what best we can do, the best thing we can contribute to NATO is a maritime defence, partly of NATO, partly of ourselves, and partly, as we found recently, when we had to go 8,000 miles across the sea, it may be to some other part of the, of the earth. But that's what we best can do, and that's what we've always best been able to do. Peter Blager, uh, how do you respond to that? Don't you think that the unilateral nuclear disarmament that Labour is proposing could be considered a bold and even a brave initiative at a time when something, badly, uh, something new is badly needed? I find it rather ironical that John Silkin has said that we should do what we can best do when another part of Labour's defence policy, which we haven't yet mentioned, is to cut our defence spending by one third. That would mean the elimination, for example, uh, of all the equipment programmes of the Navy, the Army and the Air Force. That's not strictly a nuclear matter, but I just put that uh, as uh, something which puts to sing... Well, since uh, you raise it, let's just take it up with Mr Silkin. In, in fact, in that resolution passed at Commons, there is this clause which says that we should get our contribution down to what our other Mr. major NATO partners Blake make. Made this and that point would before. make a very severe cut in defence I would bring spending, a copy of Labour's defence policy but could you just me? tell us what the effect very, of Very, very quickly, be? what it says is that we will uh, reduce our defence expenditure to the average proportion of the rest of NATO, bearing in mind, bearing in mind, Britain's need to provide adequate conventional defence forces. Well, now, what does course, that mean? Will well, we cut defence spending? It or means not? that by cutting the nuclear capital expenditure, what is it, ten billion pounds, I reckon, on Trident, we will have sufficient to have an adequate conventional defence force. But if we weren't, we still have to defend ourselves, and that is an option we would have to take at the time. You don't half defend yourself. You defend yourself properly, and if, we're going, if we believe, as we do, in conventional defence, of course it's got to be paid for. Mr Blagger. Uh, I too have a copy of the resolution passed at the Labour Party conference, and uh, it omits the qualifying words which were formerly the in the resolution. However, there would be a very severe cut, uh, according to Labour's intentions, in no. Britain's conventional forces, as well as the elimination no. of all our nuclear forces and the ejection from the United Kingdom of the American forces. Dr. Now, can I, I believe can I, that, uh, if I just uh, go into the consequences of this, because I think this is really the main point that we want to get at, I believe that this would have a profoundly destabilizing effect on our NATO allies. They want us to keep our strategic nuclear, nuclear deterrent. They've said so many times. They believe it's valuable for NATO and NATO's success to have an extra country, in addition to the United States, which possesses a strategic nuclear deterrent. I believe that uh, the course Labour is uh, proposing would also damage the very important disarmament negotiations which are now going on because it, it would take the pressure uh, off the Russians to make concessions on their side and I don't believe a single other country in the world would follow our example and I've never heard one suggested by Labour or anybody else. Dr Owen, your policy is uh, to pull back our battlefield nuclear weapons from the front line to avoid the problems of uh, a, an early use of, of nuclear weapons. You, you want to do away uh, with Trident. You don't want us to buy Trident. Um, why don't you go the whole hog and, and join Mr Silkin? Because I think it's irresponsible and dishonest if you do believe that NATO's defence policy is a combination of conventional deterrence and nuclear deterrence. I don't think at this stage Britain should give up its Polaris weapons or give up its rather modest nuclear capability and pass the burden totally to the United States. I think while Britain retains some nuclear weapons, it has a greater influence on the United States in the nuclear debate and in serious disarmament. I think if we are ready, as I certainly was in 1978, and John Silkin never complained then, about increasing our defense capability in conventional terms, we can then argue that the battlefield nuclear weapons should be withdrawn. I agree with Lord Carver. This is much the most dangerous aspect that you could have a conventional attack triggered off perhaps by accident in the central front and overrun nuclear installations within a few miles of the border. This is dangerous. And to go to no early use as NATO's strategy is the most sensible first step 
in reducing dependence on nuclear weapons. But you've got to be prepared to pay a price. And that means if you can't negotiate lower levels, increasing some parts of our conventional defense force. And quite frankly, John Silkin knows perfectly well, even if you cancel Trident uh, uh, as an incoming government, say in 1984, that will not give you any substantial savings for conventional defense. I would cancel Trident, but I'm still prepared to face up to the need, if need be, for the 3% defense commitment. And this is the dishonesty in the Labour Party program. Mr. Silkin. Well, I'm afraid David Owen really doesn't listen. That's the trouble. The peak years of Trident, the early the peak years of the expenditure of Trident are equivalent to 30% of the naval budget. Now to pretend that that is absolutely meaningless is, well I wouldn't, don't use the word dishonest, but perhaps it means that he hasn't really read the they subject. No, I think yet. if I, I may say so, the experts so tell me that the savings on Trident uh, will not enable you markedly to do anything for conventional yes. forces. Would what you disagree the expert, with that? Yes, the experts average it out over the whole period of it, maybe 15 years. But if you take the peak period, you will see that it is 30% of the naval budget. That's we haven't what reached that peak could I, could but I put we this will be reaching it in 1984-85, sometime like that. Could I put this more general point to you, Mr Silkin? There seems to be some sort of feeling that you're trying to get out from under in some way, from our responsibilities. Are you, in effect, saying to the Russians, look, we haven't got any nuclear weapons, don't do anything to us, go and have a look over there. Is, that's the no. sort of feeling one what gets. What I believe is that we need to defend this island that the best way, everybody is a member of NATO, not to help somebody else, but to help themselves. That's what collective security is about. That the defense of the whole is the best defense you've got. And I believe, as I say, and my party believes, that we need a proper conventional defense force and policy. I said, uh, that's why I say David Owen wasn't really listening or reading enough. If a proper conventional defense policy meant that you had to pay more, of course one would have to do it. There's no point in paying half the bill and not being properly defended. It makes nonsense. Well, then don't pass resolutions calling for cuts in defence expenditure. Face up to the fact that you're arguing for increase in defence expenditure. Face up to the fact that you never argued for this when you were in government. Face up to the fact that whole ranks of Labour MPs and s s cabinet ministers don't agree with the policy. Face up to the fact that none of you argued for it when you were in government. Why does it all change in the two years that you go into opposition? And the fact of the matter is that there is a serious question about nuclear weapons, and Lord Carver has pointed to it. There are dangers in the existing strategy of early use of battlefield nuclear weapons. Why doesn't the Labour Party concentrate on that serious issue, and then we can actually influence the debate rather than go off on this waft of unilateralism which undermines NATO, destroys the credibility of Britain within NATO and is deeply damaging to the cohesion of the alliance. All and everybody can, knows it. All I can say is the Labour Party's got some very respectable allies, not just among politicians, but also in the military, set up as well in its policy. And the fact of the matter is this, that the decline in nuclear expenditure means that you are able to spend more on conventional defence. Now, it may well be, and, and the defence policy says, bearing in mind the need for an adequate defence policy, you might have to spend more at some time. I don't personally believe that you would, but you might have to. One has to accept that. And I happen to believe in defending this island. What I'm saying is that, and I think you were saying it too, though you won't go the whole hog, David, on this, that if you start a nuclear war, however limited, in Europe, it will blaze into a world war in which the two superpowers are engaged with their strategic weapons. I think you accept that, or otherwise, you wouldn't be against the battlefield nuclear weapon. Well, the strategy of deterrence is that this horror will choice is never faced by any politician. The argument for deterrence is that you will never have to press this wretched button that will discharge a nuclear weapon that will destroy millions of people. And I believe we have far too many nuclear weapons. I think we can reduce safely if we can only negotiate them down on both sides. I think you start with battlefield nuclear weapons, you go to intermediate nuclear weapons. But let's face it, the idea of a second strike nuclear weapon system, which is, I understand it, Lord Carver accepts, is a necessity while the Soviet Union has nuclear weapons. What we don't want is, is early use, and nor do we want to be able to r overrun nuclear weapons within a few hours of a conventional attack. That is what is so dangerous about the present strategy. Mr. <coughs> Mr. Blager, David Owen seems to be doing your work for you there. Can I perhaps put a, a different point to you? Whatever you may feel about Labour's new policy, can you deny that they are catching the rising tide of anti-nuclear feeling in this country? We've seen this film you've produced, uh, 
I don't know whether it's a hurried film or not. You've chosen this moment to produce it. It sounds as if you're realizing that you haven't won the argument with the people. Uh, it's, I think, a film that a lot of people ought to see because it tries to explain the facts and the arguments which are behind the policy which we are pursuing and which the Labour Party uh, has pursued on all previous occasions when uh, it's been uh, in, uh, in office. If I may just make one comment, I was glad to hear John Silkin say that Labour is prepared to contemplate an increase in defence spending. That is an important new statement of policy, as far it's as I know, an uh, in the recent context. Policy. It is the logic of defending your country if that is what is the truth, but it isn't the truth at the moment. You who are spending ten billion pounds of taxpayers' money on Trident, you're the last ones to talk about increased the, expenditure. The cost of Trident, uh, uh, as we've explained, will average three percent of the defence budget average. over the eighteen years, which it what will take to bring it in. What about the peak years? Well, the, the relevant point is the average, isn't no, it? No, it isn't. May, may I, I leave if that If I can put it just another there. way, uh, the cost of Trident will be eight pounds per head of the population per year, per year for this country over the period that it's coming. And if you average it out over a hundred years, it, was no, it would no doubt be only a pound a year. Can, I, can I just, um, in the last moments that we have, come back to you, Sir Terence. Um, can I put this last thought to you? Can you really imagine any circumstances in which you, as Chief of the Defence Staff, would advise the Prime Minister to be the first to use nuclear weapons, uh, an act which would be certain to bring about the destruction of Britain, whatever it did to the enemy? How do you know it would be certain to bring about the destruction? You don't it might indeed would. stop the war. So I don't accept your premise in the first place. But you find, uh, you, you can imagine easily circumstances in which you would so advise the Prime Minister? Certainly. No problem about that? None at all. The deterrent is credible? Yes, it has been credible. It has kept the peace. Lord Carmen? No, I've already, in, in, in an interview before, said quite clearly that I, no, I would not, I, can no, I can't envisage any circumstances in which I would advise a Prime Minister to be the first to start a nuclear war by firing our own weapons, because, as you say, you, whatever might happen, you would have to assume that the other side would answer back, and not necessarily in as limited it away as you might decide to do. do, do Isn't that do true, Sir Terence? Certainly it's true, but the whole basis of deterrence is uncertainty in the mind of the enemy. Isn't the fundamental problem that to make the deterrent credible you have to persuade everybody, us, the public, the enemy, that you would do it, uh, and that when you confront the thing itself it is undoable? Well, this is a hypothetical question because we're not confronting that situation. What we're trying to do is to instill in the minds of the Soviet leadership today, in five years' time, in ten years' time, in fifteen years' time, this uncertainty that they risk the total destruction of their own country. Well, thank you all very much indeed. Gentlemen, the military gentlemen on my right and the politicians on my left, and you, Mr. Pearl, too, in Washington. Thank you all very much indeed. That's all from Panorama tonight. Good night.